Okay, we'll get started. Uh, there's probably a few more people coming in, but uh, time is short. I've got a lot of ground I want to cover in the next 30 minutes. Uh, so fasten your seatbelts, because uh, this is going to be quite a high speed ride uh, as I try and take you through, first of all, some theory uh, and then the practicalities of making your data ready for analysis in MaxQDA, doing coding uh, and so on, and then uh, reporting results um, and combining analysis in a mixed methods approach. So open-ended survey questions. Um, I, my hypothesis is that there are a possible range of methods of analysis um, between a fully manual analysis where you go th read through the responses one by one and code them individually. Uh, many people would like to have a fully automated uh, possibility uh, where you just feed them into a computer and the computer does it all. But uh, beware for, be careful what you wish for, because if such software really existed, uh, there wouldn't be much of a job left for you to do. So I'm going to posit uh, an analysis somewhere between those two extremes where the computer does what computers do well, counting, searching, grouping and things like that. And the human, you, the analyst, do what humans do well, deciding what is important, what is useful, what is interesting. How you do this depends on a variety of uh, things that we could consider on, on various spectra here. What are your analysis goals? Uh, that's an important thing to consider. If you're looking simply for quantification and statistics, uh, you'll tend more towards the automation tools that are available. But if you're really looking for explanation and insight, you'll want to keep a fair amount of manual reading and decision making, more of the human contribution. But there's a spectrum between the human and the computer here. How you collect the data will be quite significant. Now, I'm suggesting that we're, we're looking at a, an online survey uh, with um, self-completion. Um, there has been some open-ended questions asked in surveys where the interviewers uh, were asked to type in the respondents' answers. Uh, that produced some fairly poor quality data as interviewers got lazy and paraphrased what they heard. Um, Ideally, we would record and transcribe, but uh, to do that on a large number of cases is probably uh, not going to happen. Uh, so we're again in the middle with self-completion. How you design your questionnaire. Now, uh, qualitative people are not very used to issues of questionnaire design. This comes very much from the quantitative paradigm. Um, but you need to consider if you have a whole bunch of open questions that you put together in your questionnaire, you're going to create a kind of conversation episode in your interview. Um, and it's going to be more like a normal interview. Uh, whereas if you spread open ended questions around with lots of closed questions between them, uh, then your questions can be analyzed individually. So if you've got them grouped together, you'll need to analyze them together. Um, but if they're spread around, you can analyze them separately. Little question I like to ask, who does the work? Here's one for the quantitative people to <coughs> a challenge for the quantitative people, because they've been lauding it over most people for a long time. They ask closed questions. They tend to fix the categories in advance uh, by saying, you know, have a show card or a list of possible answers. Uh, and then they ask their respondents to code for them. Because when you ask a question and you give a, a, your respondent a set of six possible answers, the respondent is thinking of the answer to the question and looking for the right one, right uh, response, and they are coding. Whereas if you ask an open-ended question and collect the data in some of the ways that the internet and so on allow us, you needn't fix the categories until afterwards. And it is the analyst who does the coding work. And consider the respondent does this job once and once only. But uh, uh, in an online survey like this, you do the coding for each of the respondents. You do it many, many times. Who is going to give more consistent and accurate uh, coding work? I suggest that this might actually open ended questions in the survey might actually do better. But then we have to also have to consider what we're used to in qualitative work. We're used to doing a case by case analysis. We take one person and we take all their answers to a whole series of questions and we work through them in that way. The quantitative people are much more used to what they think of the variable perspective, where they take one question and they consider the answers by lots and lots of people. And that's what we are going to have to get used to uh, in the next few minutes as we handle this data through MaxQDA, the variable perspective, question by question, rather than the case perspective. 
The data I'm going to use comes from the English uh, example project that comes with all Max QDA projects, the work life balance example, which is, I think, believe an online questionnaire with has 55 respondents who answered mainly two open ended questions and 19 closed questions, eight demographic and 11 attitudinal. All that data is going to be brought into Max QDA in a moment. The open questions were asked separately. We're going to analyze them separately. Now, let me now jump to the data. Uh, and yes, that has come up, fortunately, jolly good. Just making sure that uh, comes up on your screens. Um, by the way, if you want to ask a question, please send it through the Q&A rather than through the chat on the right hand side. There's more chance that I might spot it. OK, so here is the source data for that um, uh, example project in an Excel workbook, uh, exactly as uh, it, it was given to me by uh, by the nice people at Max QDA. So as it came out of a survey program, we have a column for each question, and you can see the beginnings of the questions uh, up the top here. Uh, I've just highlighted in column H, what is the highest educational level that you have attained other uh, and so on. Uh, this one was uh, highest education level you've attained. So we've got the questions in the top row and they are somewhat truncated by the column widths. In the first column, we have a unique identifier for each uh, case in the survey. Um, and this is a, a standard output from most survey software, so that's OK. And then in the cells, we have the answer respondent by respondent, question by question. If I scroll across to the right, you'll see that here are here is an open question. Please explain your answer to the previous question. And we've got free text and I've clicked on the wrap text so that the full cells are uh, visible. So the big cells contain the open uh, ended question responses and the small cells, uh, single word answers tend to be uh, the closed question answers. There are a few things you need to do to make this suitable to come into Max QDA. I'm not going to do that live before your very eyes. I've got another version to save time. So here's the one I made earlier, the same data, but I've made some changes. The first change, I've inserted a column at column A and I've called it document group and I've copied and pasted all the way down the word survey. It's necessary to have a document group column so that when you import it into Max QDA, it knows where to put all the document cases uh, that are in the second column. So I'm going to put them all into a group in my uh, Max QDA document system called survey and by copying that word all the way down to the bottom of the 55 rows. Can I get to the bottom? Jump too fast. There we are down down to row 56 because there's one row for the column 55. So uh, that's uh, a necessary thing. Then I strongly suggest that you edit the uh, question names in the top row to make them short uh, so that in this um, window where I've got narrow columns, you can see what each question is about. Inside Max QDA, the longer names will be stored, but they're quite difficult to use in some of the presentations. So you want to get the unique bits of each question into the first couple, two or three words. Uh, we can have slightly longer for the open questions uh, because those appear in the coding system uh, with slightly more space. So I've edited most of the questions so that they display better. It's very important that you do not edit any of the data because that would be obviously invalidating uh, some of your research. So you can't, uh, can't go changing that, but you can add that first column and you can edit uh, the row titles. I'm now going to close uh, that uh, uh, worksheet uh, and go into Max QDA. And I've now got an empty project here. We've got no data. So I'm now going to take you through the import process uh, for bringing that data into a, an empty, a new Max QDA project. And for this, we need the import menu and the survey data option. Uh, and I'm going to import data from an Excel spreadsheet. It is possible uh, for, to bring it in from SurveyMonkey. If you've got a, if you're collecting your survey in SurveyMonkey, there is a direct uh, transfer from SurveyMonkey uh, to uh, MaxQDA, but I'm coming from Excel. So I've then got to navigate and find it. Uh, and that will take me a moment. Uh, I should have done that, uh, prepared that slightly better. Uh, but we've got to find Max Days and my open ended questions. Uh, and here we are survey results edited for import 
edited for analysis. So that's the one I want, survey results, edited for analysis, click open and we're on our way. So it's found the file and it's asking at the top which column contains the labels for the document group and it is a document group that's what i called it for the document name it's response id it's going along the top row of the spreadsheet it's found the first one because i gave it the right name so for the document name it's the response id that will put the id numbers into the uh, right place uh, in the document system and then down below for each uh, column heading in uh, the Excel spreadsheet. It's asking me, do I want to put this to code? Is it an open question or do I want to treat it as a variable? Is it a closed question? And Max Cudier makes pretty good guesses at these. So let's come down. Yes, it has guessed correctly because why more time was an open question. So that gets a tick in the code column and types of flexible work arrangements. That too is an open question that gets a tick. All the others are closed questions. These are my two open questions and 19 closed question things. Very important question down here in the options. Do I want to code empty cells? I strongly recommend you leave that blank. In that way, Max Cudier will only create a, a, a code uh, segment for positive data where people have answered and we'll be able to count how many people have answered each question positively uh, and by deduction, how many people did not answer any of the open questions. Having set those up, I'm ready to click OK and move on. Now, just for the closed questions going into the variables, I get the possibility of changing the variable type. Most of them are text. It gives me a preview uh, of the data type uh, on the right hand side. Um, age, we ask the question in age groups of 10 years uh, for this. So I'm afraid that has to be treated as text. Uh, 30 to 39 is not a numeric. It might be better to ask age as just as a straight number. Uh, and then you can you would just get numbers like the number of children that is going to go in as an integer variable. Uh, but you've got the you've got the choice of uh, uh, the standard variable one of all these different different uh, types, text, integer, decimal and so on. So when you've checked that all of your variables have got the right target type, we go on with the import and now it's doing it. Uh, it has done it. So 55 texts, uh, 55 uh, rows in the spreadsheet were found. It gives me a little summary um, and it gives me the possibility of copying this summary. And I'm going to do so in a moment. It's just telling me 55 texts, two codes, 20 imported variables. Uh, I thought there were 19, but it's got it brought 20. Well, I, I, perhaps I miscounted earlier. I'm going to click copy and close it. And I'm just going to go to my home menu, open the logbook. Uh, and in here, I'll give it today's date and I'm going to paste in that little uh, memo uh, as a summary. And I could write, type in some other, te other text uh, just as a record of what was correctly imported uh, by that, uh, that process. Uh, that's a useful little thing. Uh, it's always there in your logbook. Uh, you can put it in a memo as well. Uh, you then got something you can add in to an appendix in your final thesis. Now we've got the data inside Max QDA. Uh, in the document system, uh, we've got uh, each of the respondents. They were the, the, the data in the second column of the spreadsheet. Uh, the numbers here are showing how many questions they answered. It's only naught, one or two. If I click on respondent two, double click, that opens them up in the document browser where we can see uh, the two open questions that they've put their answers to there. And we've got codes for the two questions and those codes are down here in the code system. Uh, why more time on this particular activity and types of flexible work arrangements. And we've got code memos here. Uh, we can also see that 48 people answered the first question and 22 answered the second question. If I open up the code memo, uh, it's given it the title of the question. What I strongly recommend at this point uh, I won't haven't got time to do today, but you should actually type in here the full question wording uh, in the form that it came uh, in, in the survey. I've got the survey questions in a PDF document here um, and uh, the, the actual question was, please explain your answer to the previous question. Why would you like to spend more time on this particular activity? And the previous question was, if you could change your current time allocation, what would you spend more time on? It would be a good idea to put all of that information into the uh, uh, memo here for this 
uh, question memo rather than just the brief title why more time on this particular activity i'm going to skip that because uh, we've only got limited time i've got my data in here now if i now activate um the survey question uh, all, all the survey respondents to separate that data from uh, any other data I might have in the same project. It is the only data I've got in this project. If I go to the analysis menu, uh, here in the middle of the analysis one, we've got categorize survey data as a menu choice. And that is going to be our next tool. This is a change in MaxQDA 2022. They've now added more tools into the categorize survey data. So I now recommend this as the first port of call, first port, port of call. So I get a little dialog, drag and drop a code of the survey question from the code system window here. So I will take that first question, why more time, drag it in, put it there, why more time on this particular activity, the only for activated documents will be fine. Click OK. And it's now loading that data in and up comes a window which looks remarkably like the smart coding window, uh, which I was talking about in a session earlier today. But this is the categorized survey. It is different because it's got extra functions on the toolbar uh, and, and so on. So if you're those not familiar with smart coding over on the left, we have an extract of the code system. At the moment, it's only got one code, the question code for this particular question. But in the middle, we've got all 48 responses to this question with their IDs, respondent 24. Let me just sort this uh, so that they are actually in, in order by respondent at the moment. So we start with respondent one, two, three, four, five. We've got all of the respondents and one question. Remember in my um, um, earlier uh, uh, PowerPoint presentation where I talked about the variable perspective. Well, here we now have the variable perspective. We have one question. Uh, why the more time on this allocation? And we have all of the cases coming down the columns. So that is the structure that we have created inside this window. But it still looks very qualitative and we can work with it in all sorts of qualitative ways. You've got various decisions to make now as to how you want to proceed. And you've got various choices as to how much automation you want to use. The amount of automation depends in part on how you collected the data and what your analysis goals are. Um, but uh, uh, let me show you quickly uh, some of this uh, automation possibilities. So uh, I've got a display word count showing here. I'm just going to hide that for a moment uh, just to simplify my screen. Um, I can open a word cloud on this. Uh, so this is a word cloud for just the data inside this screen. So this is showing me the biggest words are the words that are most frequently used within the 48 responses uh, to this to this question. Um, and possibly I see friends there. It's got three hits. Uh, if I uh, double click on friends, it opens up a search window where I can see those three hits to friends in context um, and so on. And if I like if I like what I see, I can go on and create an auto code uh, for the code friends. Uh, I can choose a color for it uh, and I, I can attach it and I get the standard ones. What do I want to attach it to? I'm going to attach it to the whole paragraph. Um, we could choose just the word friends, but uh, I strongly suggest that for this kind of survey data where the responses are reasonably short, code the whole response paragraph will cover most cases. I got two segments, not three, uh, because somewhere, presumably, if I close that and close that and now look at the friends code, um, it's come up in the wrong place. Actually, I want my codes to be sub codes of this. So I just need to drag it and put it underneath the question. Uh, but look at it. Uh, and then one uh, respondent 16, uh, I suspect, uses the word friends twice. Yes, friends there. Uh, and friends there. So the, because I coded the whole paragraph, once it's coded once, uh, that's it. It gets it there. Uh, and now I can see the friends code there in respondent 16 showing where that one has come up. Go back to the word cloud another time. So I could work around keywords in here. I could also open up uh, 
the word frequencies, which is the same data as the word cloud, but in another display where I've got a frequency column uh, down here. And by scrolling down that ever reducing frequencies, I can look for significant words over here and go on and search and auto code from that. I can also code directly uh, from uh, the, the word cloud. If I'm happy that a word is going to be significant, family has got six hits right click on family and I've got an auto code with a new code one here uh, auto code any family um, uh, it's giving an extra name but let's just accept that and click OK uh, and again I'll code the paragraph um, it's done it and I've got six segments this time people haven't used family twice uh, I'll close that word cloud I finished with that and again that auto code from that has gone into slightly the wrong place I want it uh, just under friends at the same level uh, and back to the question code uh, scroll scroll down we should find family down here someone's got friends and the family code and so on now we've also got a search and auto code uh, tool possible uh, click on this if we know a, a word of interest uh, I'm going to use the word child to search on um, by not uh, using whole words, I, I will find children, uh, grandchildren, I hope, uh, but I do want it only in the listed responses, only in the 48 responses. I can run this search uh, and now I get a slightly different display because I'm still in the categorized survey data, but every instance of child is shown in its full context inside the response with this highlighting. It's no longer showing me the full 48 responses. It's just showing the eight responses where the word child is uh, is appearing. But I've got an auto code function up here at the top. So if I click on this, I can choose to auto code either the response or just the word child. This is the first time in MaxQDA that we've actually been able to autocode a whole response, which might be more than one paragraph in some circumstances. Let's take that autocode for child. I can choose a different color. I could e edit any of those things, but I'm gonna go ahead and do that. It's coded eight segments. And that one pleasingly has gone straight into the right part of the code system. So hopefully in the next update, uh, that little uh, minor error uh, that the others went slightly to the wrong place will be corrected. So that was uh, the search and autocode. And then we come to dictionaries. Uh, now, I think you probably got to have a Max QDA plus license for this. But if I select the dictionary function uh, and I've got a dictionary ready prepared for OEQ's activities, just a simple little dictionary. Um, the way these work is that in the middle section for categories, you create the words which will become your code names. So I've got a code family, a code education and a code culture. And if I select family, <coughs> excuse me, on the right hand side, it's showing me all the search items. Which I have linked to family, the word family child without it being whole words. So the children and grandchildren will also get picked up son, daughter, parent, and so on. If any of those words occur in the text, the code family will be applied. Similarly with education, you've got to be careful how you use this whole word tick uh, or whether you want it as the beginning uh, and is it case sensitive and so on. So university, course, and college are safe to have as whole words, but learn, people might talk about learning or learned, um, studying, studied, and so on. Uh, You've got to be get those right and for culture art music film and so on when it comes to applying the autocode function i might decide temporarily i don't want to autocode one of these uh, a double click on culture and a little no entry comes up it that means culture will now be excluded from the next one uh, or i can change those with uh, a context menu i think i'll, I'll exclude family uh, because i've already got a family code there so i'm going to have just education and culture let's close that and use the auto code with dictionary uh, and what i want responses paragraphs sentences or search items we'll go for whole responses again uh only in the listed responses oh no no cancel i'm, I'm wrong on there i want to go back to the master question I've got to close that search. Sorry, I didn't close that search. Uh, just go back a moment. If you've done a search and auto code for child and run the search, you get that screen to close the search. You've got to click this little X uh, here beside the search results that gets rid of it and reverts me to the 48 uh, responses uh, on this particular activity. 
and so on. So back to autocode with dictionary, uh, the responses, uh, only in the 48 responses. See how these little dialogues, they're not trivial. That spotted to me that I was making an error. I was about to only code eight segments, uh, eight uh, responses rather than all 48. And ignore inactive categories. We will not get um, a, an autocode family again. Click OK. And it does it. Uh, it's done 16 coded segments. OK, it wasn't a very big dictionary. Uh, we get a, a, an extra subheading, autocode with dictionary. And under that, we get the education and culture codes. Uh, click on the culture and there's just one response. Somebody talked about artistic work. But if we look at education, uh, this one uh, will have talked been coded because of university. Um, uh, learn Spanish, time to study. Uh, and so on. So you can see how the different words, student might have come, bring that one, evening course, uh, and so on, learn French, and so on. So the different words have all been picked up from that dictionary, uh, where for education, I had all of these possible words. And I've just shown you some examples of how each of most of those have been picked up and attached to that education code. So those are various possibilities. Uh, at the end, uh, after you've done that coding work, uh, it's quite important to check your work. Now, you've got two ways of positively confirming things. Uh, so, for example, uh, the child code, I, if I select a code on the code system on the left, uh, it displays all of the responses for that code in the middle. I can quickly read through uh, and confirm to myself that all of these segments have sufficiently common uh, ground over something to do with children that I'm happy. If there's any one that I don't like, um, uh, this one, Respondent 32, isn't talking about his own children. I'd like to do more for children in developing countries. Ah, that's a different meaning of children. Most of the others are talking about their own children. If I right click on that one, I can remove it from the code. So I can correct uh, that one should not have been coded uh, to uh, autocode child, click OK, and it's gone. Uh, and we go down to seven. So that's how you can correct overcoding uh, where the automation was a little bit too enthusiastic. All right. Um, if I come back to the main question code and sort on the codes column at the top, it shows me all the columns, all the rows which haven't yet got a code in them. Uh, lots because I've only done a little bit of coding. Uh, but this will be a good place uh, before you finish to go back and check that everything that should have been coded has been coded. And I strongly recommend over here in your code system that you add a code for no uh, usable answer or something like that uh, for the cases where people just give you a little bit of nonsense. Um, uh, so here, because I like it, um, I'm going to drag that over and put that into no usable answer uh, and it, it's dropped down the list uh, now uh, to somewhere much further down. Uh, so that's how you can manually code as well. You can create codes at, at, at any stage. Let's come back to the full question, uh, resort in uh, document order. Uh, so a couple of checks to make sure that everything is fine on that score. Two more things to show you in this. Uh, I can analyze sentiments. This is another new feature in version 2022, not available before. Uh, sentiment analysis. Uh, let's click on it. Uh, we've only got two languages possible, English and German. More languages will be added in the future. Uh, the reference to hashtags is because this tool was really designed for sentiment analysis in Twitter, in tweets. Um, but they also realized it might be quite useful in uh, the open-ended questions in surveys. Word, stop word lists could be very significant in this. So it's, I would suggest you don't apply a stop word list until you had a chance to inspect your sentiment uh, analysis more closely. Uh, so now we get a sentiment grading uh, between slightly positive, positive, neutral. Uh, I don't think we even get any. Oh, yes, slight, there was a slightly negative and so on. It, the sentiments come on a five point scale, like a Likert scale between positive and negative with slightly each either side and neutral in the middle. Um, this data in this particular example isn't very good for this. Uh, so I'm just what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, add in the word count. Uh, and I'm going to sort 
the data by the word count, the longer responses are more likely to contain words or language which might have some meaning of, of sentiment. Uh, I'm going to scroll down a little bit to match the example I've shown in the handout. Uh, so here uh, we've got some we've got a slightly positive, a couple of neutrals, another more slightly positive, and so on. What it is saying is it's counting uh, words which are interpreted as positive and words which are interpreted as negative and then comparing those. Uh, although it shows the difference, it is not simply on the difference. Uh, there are more calculations in the background. Read the help manual about this if you're really interested in this particular tool uh, to find out more about it. Um, but it grades uh, them. Uh, so this neutral, the positive and negative are very similar. Um, where was a slightly negative one? I, I think I did have a slightly negative, didn't I? Can't, can't find it now. Somewhere there was a slightly negative. We should find... Uh, sure, I saw one. Never mind. Uh, if the negative words out, outweighed the positive words, we'd get a slightly negative if they did so in sufficient numbers. Uh, you can autocode uh, the responses with that sentiment value. So that would simply attach these. So if I add that, uh, yes, we'll have all of those and click OK. Uh, so now we get a new code group with sentiment. Um, it's still doing it. Uh, but we can see the positive ne uh, to negative and the whole scale there. It's done the 48 responses. Uh, so let's look at for the slightly negative. Let's open up the slightly negative. Um, and uh, I can no longer see the sentiment analysis. Um, but we've got some uh, words like stressful um, is probably um, increase my hours in my paid job. don't know how it knew that that was negative. That's rather clever. Um, the data doesn't really suit sentiment analysis, uh, but I, I wanted to show it to you. Um, and you could have then, of course, later on when we close the categorized survey data, uh, which I'm doing now, uh, and we've got those down here, we could actually convert this uh, to a um, uh, categorical, transform into a categorical document variable, uh, and then we have the slightly positive, slightly negative uh, possibilities uh, we can use with va variable categories. Now, I'm now going to switch uh, to a different project, um, which has... Um, much more coded data. So the same data, but now I've got many more responses already coded down here to both questions uh, so that I can just uh, show you this. Uh, let me just uh, go back into the analysis and just show you what it looks like when I bring that same question in here uh, with much more coding in place. So we've got all of these uh, questions. So I did a lot of work in between, uh, uh, but but now we've got all of these these things here. You can see more codes appearing in this margin, but there are still some uh, blank ones. So if I sort on that, uh, we still got quite a lot of ones which still need some some work on them. Uh, so there's more coding work for me to do there. But uh, we've got we've got quite a lot of data on that. Uh, I want to show you briefly reporting results. Uh, so if we go to the uh, uh, on the analysis uh, menu, uh, the code frequencies could be quite useful for this. Uh, I'm going to activate uh, the second question uh, and go to the analysis code frequencies. Uh, and I want to insert activated codes. So I get all of the uh, second ones. This is where it's useful having the analysis codes immediately as subcodes of the question. Uh, I don't actually want the question itself, so I'm going to exclude it from there. Only for activated documents. Click OK. Uh, and I get a table of those frequencies. But it's when I turn that into a chart uh, and possibly a horizontal bar chart that things start to get more interesting. Um, I don't think I want percentages. I think I want to have actual numbers uh, and so on. And I've got various facilities here to change the color schemes. I can add titles uh, and so on uh, to turn this chart into something really meaningful. There's a better looking one in the handout you'll find. Um, and I can send it from here to the QTT worksheet to store that uh, there or export it uh, directly to go into uh, presentations and so on. But there I can report the results of my analysis of that survey question. If I go to the variables, I can do the same uh, with the document variable statistics for any of my closed questions. Um, 
let's say take the highest educational value um, uh, click OK uh, and here is the chart of their various uh, educational ones uh, and, and I can show, show that uh, as bar charts and so on so that's how I can handle each of the closed questions but what gets really exciting is when we put it all together uh, let's come back to back to the, the first question uh, and go to the mixed methods and open up a cross tab um, I've got one already set up where I port the eight let's but let, let me show you how to do it properly let's clear the list okay uh, for setting up a cross tab I want to have all variable values as conditions um, and uh, uh, we want the uh, the age variable move that in um, and that was what I, I just removed now if it doesn't come up in the right order you can move things around in this just by dragging them around uh, that's obvious nonsense so let me put it back uh, so you can get the order right before you go on uh, only for activated and only for activated codes that tick is quite useful click OK and now I get a table which combines qualitatively coded data with the closed quantitative questions uh, showing how people in the different age groups answered these or have been coded to these particular uh, uh, coded values for why more time on this particular activity and I've got the possibility of adding heat maps of, of turning percentages on or off or going back to straight numbers um, or column percentages uh, or row percentages uh, and, and so on so lots and lots of uh, possibilities there uh, and then interpret um, using the full power of max QDA to combine both your closed and open questions slightly overrun but let me come to the Q&A now um, somebody's been answering lots of questions for me that's fantastic um, so I'll look for the ones that haven't been answered uh, so Joko asked about the sentiment analysis at the moment Joko it's only English and German um, keep in touch with Max QDA if you want sentiment analysis in another language um, uh, they say that it is coming but I, I can imagine it's quite a lot of work um, with a language specialist um, if you are interested in the sentiment analysis I strongly recommend uh, that you go and look at the um, reference manual the help manual uh, on that bit um, if I come back to uh, categorize survey data uh, bring in here I we'll have that one um, just, just let it load it uh, when I go into the analyze sentiments there is the help button uh, to take you to the right page for sentiment analysis uh, and it does have links because the thing that was interesting in my mind was which words in English are being treated as positive and which as negative do I agree uh, in the context of my particular data requirements they are apparent I believe editable so you can take the standard one uh, and change it if you want for your purposes um, but it would be an awful lot of work to do for your own language uh, from scratch um, I'm afraid and also the dictionaries I didn't mention as I was going through those um, it's a lot of work to create a dictionary for a whole project I know when you come to the autocode with dictionary it's one or two clicks and it does multiple codes in one go while you go and make a cup of coffee um, but it's only really worth the, the labor of creating uh, those dictionaries um, if you're going to reuse them time and time again if you've got an online survey with multiple waves you're doing a longitudinal study using an online survey maybe uh, then it might be worth creating a dictionary with the first wave because it'll pay back when you come to the second and third waves that might be a, a useful one or if you're going to keep on sampling different groups of people in different studies but with the same sorts of questions uh, you can reuse them because dictionaries can be moved around by putting them into global dictionaries then they're available to any project uh, that you you care to open um, any other questions that look interesting even though they've been answered um, let's scroll to the top or something else uh, mirror are there things one might need to consider when analyzing thousands of open-ended survey responses uh, yes <laughs> why why have you got thousands uh, might be my, my, my first question uh, a thousand is uh, regarded as a pretty strong sample if it's truly random um, and uh, to if you sample 10,000 but they're not random uh, you're just making a lot of work uh, which isn't necessarily giving you any more value 
Um, but if even so, it's a sensible question if you've got a lot of open-ended survey responses. You've got to think of the trade-off. Uh, if I go back to my uh, um, uh, slides at the beginning, there's a kind of trade-off uh, on se several of these dimensions. The more you use uh, automation, I didn't. I, I possibly need a spectrum for it. The more automation you use, the more mistakes there will be because some people will use a word in a different sense uh, to others. I had that with children. Somebody wanted to help children in other countries rather than his own children. Um, uh, but when you automate, the computer doesn't always pick up those differences. So the more automation you use, the, the either you've got to tolerate a certain amount of error in your answers or you're going to have to build in some means of checking uh, that, uh, that they are still sufficiently consistent. Um, but on the other hand, if you want to be really accurate, it's going to take you a long time to manually analyze a thousand responses. Uh, so you will need to do some, some searching. So that's where the sort of hybrids uh, come in that this tool has been designed for, that the ability to search <coughs> and within the search and autocode, you can choose to exclude some hits because they're wrong uh, and that sort of thing. So um, you can explore that. Um, but this is this tool has been designed for, to, to help you with your task. You've got a large number of open ended survey responses. You'll need to come up with a mixture of automation or semi automation tools and human or manual corrections, checks, um, and making up the difference, uh, deciding, uh, if I go back to my uh, this, the human doing deciding what is important, useful, and interesting, and the computer doing the routine stuff, counting, searching, and grouping. Uh, that's what you're essentially asking. If you've got a huge number, um, you're going to use rely more and more on the computer here. You've got to get cleverer and cleverer at how you use your skills to pick up where the computer has got it wrong. Uh, I think that's, uh, that's really what I'm trying to say there. Uh, any other questions, uh, uh, Tamara? Is there anything you've seen that uh, I should really be uh, uh, looking for? Oh, lots more things coming in. Uh, Uti, would you say the categorized survey tool is appropriate for deductive approach as you have predefined codes? Most certainly, Uti, yes. You can simply, you can create your codes in advance, uh, uh, even before you open up the categorized survey data tool. Any codes you've created in your code system will be brought in, as you saw me do when I loaded the part coded project. Uh, those codes come in and they're then available to be used. Um, there are some difficulties. Uh, some of these tools uh, don't let you use an existing. The word cloud uh, does, but I think the um, uh, search and autocode, uh, this one, uh, when we searched on child and ran that search. Uh, unfortunately, this only allows me to add new codes. Uh, I can't use this search and autocode and add to an existing code. What is suggested is that I create a new code with a name similar to the other one or do the autocoding and then separately outside uh, the um, uh, close that search, but outside uh, the search and autocode the, the categorized survey data tool, I can use the possibility that at any stage down here, you can merge two codes uh, by right clicking on one uh, and using the um, move coded segments uh, and then right click on the other code and there'll be a uh, move coded. So say I want to put that not enough time into learning new things, paste coded segments from not enough time. I'm not going to go ahead with that. Um, because uh, I don't want to do that merge. But uh, that's how you can get around that little uh, little problem, UT. But yes, you can certainly use it for a deductive approach where you have predefined codes. Um, uh, Allah is asking how to exclude uh, little words that you don't want from the word cloud. In the word cloud, let me go back in uh, to this again uh, and uh, drag that one in uh, and we'll open up the word cloud when we get it. Here is the word cloud. You've got lots of uh, possibilities in the word cloud and you have got the possibility of applying a stop list. Uh, and you can have a variety of stop lists. We've just got, uh, uh, I've just got the standard one at the moment. See that big I in the middle? Uh, if I rearrange it, 
Oh, was that not in the stop list? Try that one. I'm surprised that I isn't. OK, well, in the, uh, what I can do, I can point to it and I can add it to the stop word list. Rearrange. And I've got rid of it. So difficult words that you don't want that are crowding out uh, this two now. Uh, right. I can add it to the stop list that way. And straight away it goes rearrange and I get a new one and so on. So in that way, you can work through fairly quickly uh, getting rid of uh, the articles um, and pronouns and things that you don't want uh, uh, from the word cloud analysis. So hopefully that, that's answered Alar's question. We've got to the end of 45 minutes. I, I warned you that it was going to be a, uh, a, a high speed ride. Please do download the uh, handout. There is one reference at the end of it that you might find useful. It is now an article that's 10 years old, but it does set out the justification for this kind of approach, for this kind of, of data. Uh, a, a journal article that I contributed to with uh, Jane and Nigel Fielding uh, from the University of Surrey uh, in 2012. So there is one reference on the handout, uh, a lot more instructions to do what I've rapidly done um, but uh, should be sufficient for you to follow through uh, and repeat much of what I've shown you on here uh, in, in, this, uh, in this webinar. So I think uh, that's, that's my allotted 45 minutes. Thank you very much for being with me um, and uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. Uh, there was a link, Anthony, uh, much higher up the chat with the handout. Uh, where the handout is, can scroll to the top of the chat, only a few items in at the chat, there is a link. Um, in fact, I think Tamara's anchored it at the top of the chat, so you can actually see it. Uh, it looks like it's anchored there, uh, so you can probably see it. Just look up your screen. She's put it in again. There you go. Um, so you're very welcome. Good luck with your research. I hope that this helps you uh, get more and more useful stuff out of your surveys. Yes.